Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ryan Coonerty. I'm the mayor of Santa Cruz, and so I know who the applause are for, meaning Jacqueline. Um, but uh, I am uh, I'm also one of the organizers of the What's Next Lecture Series, and tonight it's my pleasure to invite, to invite you and in, encourage you to listen to an incredible speaker who has, uh, has really transformed the way that philanthropy uh, can be done and the way investment can be done for uh, needy communities in a s sustainable way. Uh, a couple things before we begin tonight. One is make sure you turn off your cell phones, please, uh, and, uh, and any other electronics that may go off during this event. Um, the second thing is uh, I want to take a, ch a moment to thank our sponsors tonight. The What's Next Lecture Series is a collaboration between the City of Santa Cruz, Next Space Coworking and Innovation, and College Aid up here at UCSC. And it's a long... There we go, it's some College Aid students here tonight. Um, and so uh, we, uh, it's a, it's, it'll be a year-long series, and we're looking at, uh, innova we're looking at innovation for the, better for the greater good. And uh, we have a perfect speaker tonight, and I hope you pay attention to our upcoming speakers uh, going forward. The other thing is I want to thank tonight's sponsor uh, is Pacific Mountain Advisors and Michael Mira. Uh, where's Michael? Stand up, Michael. So I want to say, not only is uh, Michael a supporter of this event, but he's also incredibly active in making our community a better place through the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, through a variety of philanthropic efforts that try to make our community a more just uh, and, and mo have more opportunity for all groups of people in our community. And I want to thank Michael for his leadership in Santa Cruz. Um, finally, uh, I, I just want to take a moment to thank our speaker. I, Jacqueline and I met at a, uh, at a couple Aspen Institute events, and I've been begging her for a year now, uh, some might say hounding her to come. Uh, and I really appreciate her taking time out of her schedule, incredibly busy schedule, to be here, uh, because I think she has something valuable to say to not only the world, but specifically the Santa Cruz community about how we can be entrepreneurial, how we can be innovative and change the world. And uh, because I'm mayor, I, I wanted to take this opportunity to issue a proclamation, because that's what mayors do. Um, so there's a lot of whereases, and you all know all the reasons why Jacqueline and the Acumen Fund are amazing. But I want to make it known that today, uh, October 19th, is Blue Sweater Day in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, <laughs> And so I'm encouraging all Santa Cruzans to go read the book. If you haven't yet, Bookshop Santa Cruz, uh, the books are outside, and she will be signing books afterwards. Um, and so please do. It's an inspiring story. It's a, something you're going to benefit from if you haven't already. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jacqueline Novogratz to tonight's What's Next Lecture series. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Coonerty. I, I thought Blue Sweater Day meant you guys would all show up wearing blue sweaters. Um, but I really appreciate that, um, the proclamation. And it's just wonderful to be here in um, Santa Cruz, coming from New York City. You all go to one of the most beautiful universities in the world. And um, just being here is revitalizing to my own spirit. And so very excited. And Michael, thank you for sponsoring tonight's um, event as well, and to the university in general, and to the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I want to start actually by talking about where we are in the world today. Uh, it's a time of so much uncertainty, chaos, certainly for your generation. Uh, you look around the world and you see the financial markets, um, Occupy Wall Street, what's happening there. Arab Spring, the famine in North Africa, and trying to make sense of it all in a world that, as Aristotle would say, is moving at fever pitch so fast. How do we keep up with all the changes, all the complexity? In many ways, I think that the, the biggest problem we have to face as a world is this growing gap between rich and poor. Um, in the United States, now the top 1% control more wealth than the bottom 90% of us. And um, looking at it on a worldwide basis, you see those statistics up there. It is not sustainable for the world. Uh, you combine that with what's happening with global warming, um, real concern about resources, and it means that we need new systems. 
we really need a, a, a time of renewal. Renewal not only of our government systems, our civil society, but renewal of the systems of capitalism itself. Um, not easy to do, but there's never been a moment like today to do it. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about my background um, with, with uh, apologies for those of you who read the book. But um, I actually started my career uh, during a recession, during a financial crisis in the early 1980s with Chase Manhattan Bank. And I was traveling around the world, writing off a lot of loans that should never have been made in countries like Brazil, um, Colombia, Argentina. But it was really Brazil that changed my life because on the one hand, I loved banking. I loved seeing how you could invest in entrepreneurs and companies and see that money being turned into jobs and ideas that were made real. The problem for me was that low-income people, people in the lower middle class even, not only couldn't get access to credit, but they couldn't even walk into the doors of the bank. And so decided that I wanted to try something new. I had read about the Grameen Bank, the microfinance bank in Bangladesh, which was started in 1976 by Mohammed Yunus. And this was pre-internet. So I wrote him a letter and I wrote the other three microfinance bank um, organizers around the world. Didn't get anything back, but I finally met someone in New York City. And she agreed to send me to West Africa, which was a bit of a disaster. And I ended up um, finding myself in Kigali, Rwanda. When I was in Rwanda, that's me in the middle, um, 25 years old, I decided I would try to start my own bank. Um, this, in this case, though, with five Rwandan women, very prominent women. Um, and I really dis discovered that a small group of people can change the world. Um, within a few years, we became the largest lender in the country, and it was a heady, extraordinary time. We focused on social justice, we focused on women, we focused on economic empowerment. Um, it was nothing but optimism, and we knew that we were making history. So you can imagine what it felt like in 1994 to open up the New York Times and read about the Rwandan genocide, not knowing what had happened to the women I had loved, the institutions I had helped create. Uh, so I went back to Rwanda, and I um, discovered that they had played out every conceivable role of genocide, including being killed in the first hour, to seeing their families being killed, to being major perpetrators. Uh, the one woman who I keep her name is Agnes in the book. Um, and I remember sitting knee to knee with her in the prisons uh, before she was convicted for capital crimes of genocide. And I had to um, think about what monsters look like and realize that they don't necessarily look like these scary beings. They look like us because they live inside of all of us, as do our angels. And um, that what the world really needs are those institutions that suppress our monsters and bring out our better angels. And so it was really from all these lessons of banking, of working in Rwanda, the civil society, um, seeing both that markets by themselves are never going to solve problems of poverty. They too often oversee the poor. But on the other hand, top-down approaches to aid, development, charity, um, creates dependence, which is the opposite of dignity. And that if we really wanted to create a world where every human being had access, we had to start focusing on those systems that allowed dignity, those systems that allowed choice, those systems that allowed us to be seen as full-bodied human beings. So in 2001, we started Acumen Fund with this idea that we would create a nonprofit venture capital fund for the poor. Mouthful, what does it mean? It meant that we would raise philanthropy, or charitable organization, but rather than give away handouts to low-income people, we would invest in entrepreneurs that had the tenaciousness and the stubbornness and the vision to see low-income people as agents of change. And they were going to go into those areas where neither government was working nor were the private sector, focusing on basic services, water, health, housing, alternative energy, uh, most recently education. And we were going to start in India, and then we ended up in Pakistan, and we um, are now working in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, just opened offices in Nigeria and Ghana. And we were going to use this thing called patient capital, which I'm going to talk about in a little while, but essentially leave our money for a really long time and measure what we uh, saw, both in terms of whether we'd get the money back, but more importantly, um, whether we were making social impact. And 10 years later, the good news is, 
we've discovered that patient capital really works. We've seen the $70 million that we've invested bring over $200 million into these companies that are serving some of the poorest people on the planet. Created over 50,000 jobs and seen goods and services move now to over tens, ten million, tens of millions of people. And I'm gonna give you some of the examples of what, how that actually works. Um, so the question is, what is patient capital? Um, if you're a venture capitalist, often you think patient capital is five to seven year money. For Acumen Fund, patient capital has a different kind of moral imperative. We are looking for using capital, money, our hopefully most risk-oriented capital, charitable money, to invest in entrepreneurs who are willing to go into these markets that have been totally, have totally failed. And they're willing to go for a long time. We used to think it was five, seven, nine years. Now we think it's more like 10 to 15 years. These guys are focused on solving social problems, first and foremost. We want to get the money back for discipline, for rigor, but they're not focused first and foremost on short-term financial gain. Secondly, they're fighting all kinds of things. This bad infrastructure, I took this picture when I was up in no northern Pakistan on the border of Afghanistan. This is actually one of the best roads in the country, but it got hit by a flash flood. Luckily, we were on the right side of the road because the mud was about 10 feet deep within 15 minutes. We couldn't get to the other side. Had we been on the wrong side, it would have taken us three days to get to where we were going. So bad infrastructure or no infrastructure, high levels of corruption, and hardly any trust because this is a group of people, low-income communities, that has been let down over and over and over again. So it takes a really long time for entrepreneurs to figure out how to deliver these services. Third, they need to be able to fail a lot. Because they're trying to go into areas where people have no exposure to this kind of work, they often have high levels of fatalism as well. They try many different things and they often don't work. So we needed to figure out a system where we could invest, bring a lot of support, but leave our money for a very long time so that we'd give entrepreneurs the opportunity to figure out what it was going to take to bring services to people that no other system had figured out. So I want to give you an example. I want to take you to Bihar, India. So despite shining India, Bihar is one of the poorest states in the world. There's about 90 million people in the, in the state. Um, if you put Bihar on the African map, it would be the second poorest country in Africa and the second largest country. $200 a year is the per capita income. It's also a place where 65 million people of the 90 million people have no access to ele uh, electricity by conventional means. In fact, government declared the 65 million people, quote unquote, economically impossible to reach with conventional electricity. So people depend on kerosene, which is dirty, it's dangerous, it's polluting. 100 million tons of carbon go into the environment every year because of the use of kerosene. People buy little bits of it every single day. It can be 15 to 20 percent of their income. So enter um, the people we like best in the world, those crazy entrepreneurs that when they hear the word impossible, that's when they run toward the problem. Gayanesh Pandey, um, born in Bihar, educated at some of the best schools in India. Then he went to Rensselaer Polytech in New York, and he ended up in the semiconductor industry in, in Los Angeles. When he was about 30, 32 years old, he woke up one morning and said, I'm from this part of the world that's been written off by too many people and I want to go back and I want to figure out how to solve the energy problem. Like so many entrepreneurs, Gainesh started with what he knew, what he thought was going to be the answer, so he focused on solar. Totally failed. Wasn't going to work for a place like Bihar where you've got 16-hour drives to some of the villages that he was working in. Um, then he tried Jatropha, uh, a biomass. Um, didn't work. And he finally... Um, woke up one morning and realized that he was in the middle of the rice belt and that maybe the solution was all around him. And he started experimenting with gasifying the rice husk, the, the husk around the rice, and saw that in fact he could turn this into electricity, into energy. And so he started negotiating with farmers to buy their waste and um, use this gasifying system 
costs between $25,000 and $35,000, depending on size, um, to convert the rice husk into electricity. At the beginning, he needed grant money. Uh, Shell Foundation really helped him a lot. And over time, he finally developed a business model because he figured that if he used a really cheap, cheap infrastructure, he could deliver this product for a dollar a month per 40-watt bulb. Um, and Acumen Fund invested patient capital in the company at this time. Today, about 200,000 people are electrifying their homes with husk power electricity. What's been incredible for us is that in these villages that NGOs won't go in, private market won't go in, government won't go in, you're seeing 80 to 90 percent conversion rates. 80 to 90 percent of households choosing to pay for the husk power electricity to change their lives. And to go into these villages, if you, at night, it's like walking through a blanket of darkness and suddenly seeing all these lights in the households is just incredible. Going to um, thinking about other issues that are really hard to crack, clean water. How do you get clean water to rural households um, throughout India? India is a country that has 400 million people with very limited access to clean drinking water, 200 million people with no access to clean drinking water. Um, I thought it would be easy when we first went into drinking water to find those companies that were really working for the poor. But in fact, we couldn't find one for a really long time. Um, my colleague, Asmina Zaidwin, and I actually first found Water Health International back in 2004. And this was the first plant that they made. Again, the entrepreneur comes in, he thinks he's listening to the poor, but brings in the conception of the kind of plant that thought he thought would work best. Um, for lots of reasons, it didn't. Not only was it too expensive, all the um, materials had to be imported, but again, you're going down almost uninhabitable roads. Um, but also, it was kind of an eyesore, and the village um, thought it was really ugly. And so um, we helped them out. We sent in an architect. They did a redesign, and they created a very streamlined plant that could be compartmentalized, if you will, and moved out. Again, they made a ton of mistakes, trying to fight elites who thought that it was unethical for the poor to pay for clean drinking water, despite the fact that 200 million people had no access. Government that said, water's free, so why should people um, even bother being given this water um, through this service? And the poor themselves that said, water comes from God, God will decide whether we get sick or not. Had to learn how to find ways to show low-income people that if they paid for the clean water, their health would improve, their children's health would improve. And so tried lots of different ways, but finally, either by using a magnifying glass to show them the biological contamination in the water that they were drinking and comparing it to the water that they were getting from water health was when we started seeing a tipping point. We also had to listen to the customers and realize that a UV filtration process would give you clean water, but it didn't taste good. And that all of us make our decisions not based just on what we should do, because this clean water will keep our kids clean and safe, but we want things that provide safety, that taste good to us. So they used a reverse osmosis um, filter at the end and made the water taste sweet. We care about uh, status. We, we care about comfort. The entrepreneurs that Acumen Fund works with understands this because they listen to low-income people. I was telling this story before at dinner. I never thought that we would invest in ambulances um, at Acumen Fund, but what we want to do is, as Ryan said, we want to innovate. We want to go into those places, those systems that right now in the world are broken. So when Shafi Mather came to us and said that he was going to create a better ambulance system in India, we listened to him. Because at the time in India, uh, this is back in 2006, in a city like Bombay that has 17 million residents, there were only 70 working ambulances, and none of them had the technical equipment that you would expect to find in an ambulance in this country. In India, if you want to go to the hospital, you call a taxi. If you want to call, go to the morgue, you call an ambulance. So 90% of the people inside ambulances are dead. Um, Shafi wanted to change that system, and as did his partners. So they created a system 
that one refused to play in the corruption game. Absolutely no bribes allowed throughout the system. Two, was really good at marketing, so bright yellow ambulances, um, the numbers on the side, educating people that we can change something that behaviorally we haven't expected, we can start to have higher expectations. And three, created a company based on the ethos of service for all. So if you're taken to an expensive uh, private hospital, you pay. And if you're taken to a poor uh, free public clinic, you pay what you can afford. If there's an act of terror or you get in an accident on the street, it's free. And if you can't afford anything, it's free as well. Um, today, that company has grown and grown and grown. It's fought corruption battles. It's fought many different battles. But it runs about 650 ambulances. This year, it took 500,000 people to hospital. And it um, employs 3,500 people. It's the largest ambulance company today in India. And it, um, we believe if it gets the contract, we hope it will next month, it will be the largest ambulance company in Asia. It wouldn't have grown like this. It wouldn't have gone to scale if it weren't for government. So a lot of the innovation we're seeing starts with the private sector. We talk about the market as a listening device, but it recognizes that the market is limited. And so when it sees that limitation, then it has an opportunity to work with government, but it, government has a model that can work. And so that's why 1298 is able to grow across India. That's why Water Health International is able to reach four million people now across India and go into West Africa. D-Light actually came out of Stanford. Two young guys, Sam Goldman and Ned Tozen, who were dreaming of what it would take to bring solar um, light into homes across the developing world. And they thought a $36 solar lamp would make a lot of sense, particularly given how much people pay for kerosene every month. But low-income people don't make decisions for what they're going to buy based on long-term cash flow. They think about the cash that's in their pocket on any given day. So they failed again at the beginning. But long over a couple of years, they kept changing their prototype until they got the cost of the solar lamp down to $6. It's now the cheapest, most inexpensive solar lamp in the world. And um, the company has grown again. And now they manufacture in China, they distribute in India, they're moving it into Tanzania and across Africa. And we're seeing growth rates in Tanzania move faster than they are in India because you're looking at places where 90% of the country has no access to electricity. A couple of weeks ago, they passed three and a half million people who now have access to affordable, clean, safe solar technology. Life Spring Hospitals in India wanted to break the back of the fact that women have no choice. You either go to a private hospital and pay $250, $350 to have a baby, or you go to the free government hospital, um, which isn't really free, because not only do you have to pay all the expenses yourself, but normally you have to bribe um, for your child when the child's delivered more for a boy than for a girl. And so LifeSpring decided that it wanted to create a different kind of model and so has a, a franchise model where women are treated as full-bodied participants again. They paint it pink because they understand that women care about beauty. You have a semi-private room, and we're watching this grow across India. We're also seeing a model that we hope that government will pick up so that we can do a better job again bringing maternal health care to low-income people. Because of my background in... Um, places that have really been devastated, Rwanda, uh, many places actually. Um, rebirth is something I, I think about a lot, rebirth, renewal. Um, and so Gulu, for people who don't know Uganda, is in northern Uganda. It's a place that was really decimated by the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, if you guys have been listening to the news lately, President Obama just spent 100, sent 100 uh, agents in to try to go after Joseph Kony, who's the, the leader of this really, really uh, hardcore, vicious army. Gulu is a district where about two million people were displaced for 20 years. They lived in um, internally displaced camps with just huts sleeping on the mud floor, really gaining no skills. And um, they're just coming back now to, uh, to Gulu. 
the good the only good news of this story is that because they left the land fallow for 20 years now you've got this incredibly rich black soil where you just kind of put a cotton seed in and the cotton grows and so acumen funds invested in a cotton gin um, and these gins are just extraordinary because some of them come from 1948 1963 england and they're they still work and to come and see now 35,000 farmers who really were de-skilled, if you will, coming in to create beautiful cotton to sell to the gin, which then sells to India, um, for me is such a metaphor for how much we can heal this world if we're more thoughtful about how we work with low-income people, give them the chance to change their own lives. And this guy, Joseph here, I talked to him about his life and he said, when he went to the camps, um, he had one child. He had been working as a healthcare attendant at the time. Um, all four of his brothers were killed. He lost his uh, mother, not his father. And um, when he came back from the camps, he said, I, don't have, I didn't gain any skills, I didn't make any income, but I did bring back eight additional children because there wasn't a lot to do in the camps. Um, and, so, and so he's like, I got to grow a lot of cotton, clearly. Um, and, but the excitement that he has, and for the next generation, is really quite extraordinary. And I'm his same age, and I was thinking to myself, in those, 20, those same 20 years, I've been able to see the whole world. I've had a whole different trajectory, and yet I could be him and he could be me. And so the question is, how do we create these stories where we really are part of each other's success? I want to end with two stories that I think are really um, critical about the world we live in today, both in terms of why we need to break the back of systems that are already broken, why we need to imagine a different world where all people can have access to the economy, to opportunity, but also why moral leadership is so important. The first story, both of the stories are in Pakistan, but the first story is in a place called Bahawalpur, which is in the, the the southern Punjab, and is known for its extremist madrasas. Um, kind of a forgotten place, it's highly feudal. And the farmers who work there typically work on big landlords' um, land for very, very small pay. They typically don't own their own land, although now they're starting to buy maybe an acre, maybe two acres at most, um, and have kind of hard scrabble lives where they try to scratch out a living. They all depend on the money lenders. They typically pay about 600% every six months to borrow money for their fertilizer, their seeds, the inputs for their farms. And Acumen Fund's been working with this organization called NRSP uh, that's been lending to the farmers, had been lending to the farmers as a nonprofit. We helped convert it into a for-profit bank, um, which we're very, very proud of. And I went last um, July or June, I think, uh, which is a really bad time to visit Pakistan because in Bahawalpur, the temperature hovers between about 118 and 125 degrees. Um, so to say that we were hot is quite the understatement. But um, it didn't seem to matter to these farmers because this was their bank. And we talk a lot about dignity at Acumen, but to actually see it play out is so extraordinary because you can't see it here, but we're in the bank. You can see how hot it is. Um, and what I didn't notice, but the farmer certainly noticed, was one of those little ticker boxes that um, have a digital number that is connected to the piece of paper you're given with the number on it so that you wait in line, but they call your number up. And I was talking to the farmers about why did it really matter to them that there was this commercial bank that was serving, to that, serving them. And one of the farmers said, you see that clock, madam? That's what they have in the rich people banks, and now we're being treated the same way. We need to change our systems so that we treat each other the same way. These farmers, um, almost 200,000 of them now, are buying, are borrowing from NRSP, and they're paying back at 100%. Um, this is their bank. And in fact, over the last five, six months, this bank has, has raised over $7 million in deposits from some of the poorest farmers in the world. So money has existed in this economy that no one even knew about. But because there had been no trust, it had all been put under mattresses. And now there's an outlet for people to start changing their lives. And what's extraordinary is when I was talking to the farmers in a group, 
um, in this part of the world that people think is really scary, um, really in a, being seen in a really cynical way. I asked these farmers um, if they were president of the country, what they would do. And the farmers, first of all, it took a really long time to even get over the idea that they could possibly be president. Um, but when they finally did, one of them said, the first thing I would take on is inflation because our food prices have increased 60% in the last two years. And then a farmer said, I would take on load shedding. Load shedding is a word that means uh, blackouts or brownouts of, of energy, 15, 16 hours a day in this part of Pakistan. And a third said, I would take on the fact that petroleum distribution is so scarce so that because we depend on public transport to get our agricultural products to market, we need something that's more reliable. And I said to them, well, what about the war on terror? Is that one of your concerns? And um, the, one of the farmers very politely said, Madam, that is certainly not our concern. Um, and so you go to the people that in this country where people are aspirational, they're working hard, and their governments, Pakistan and US, are having this huge fight about the war on terror, throwing aid and military things at ideas that have really very li little relevance to the people that are trying to make the change. I think there's such an opportunity for us to think differently about building systems that we all can participate in if we really want to make serious change in the world today. And the last story I'll share also from that country um, connects to something we care very much about at Acumen Fund, which is what we call moral leadership. Um, a young man named Javad Aslam. We have a fellows program at Acumen at a global level, and we're starting to build them at a regional level, where we look for people who are curious, insatiable, they want to change the world, and they're ready to build operational skills, financial skills, and what we call moral imagination, the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes and build solutions from that perspective. Javad has all of that. Born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, he was working in the commercial real estate industry when 9-11 um, happened. And he decided he wanted to go to Pakistan to see what he could do to contribute to that country. He didn't really know how at the time, but he had a skill set in housing. And so he came to us, and we connected him to this man named Tasneem Siddiqui, who had been working in slums for 35 years, and he understood, again, how low-income people make decisions, how you could create community, not just housing. He hardly made any money, about $400 a month, um, for over a year in, in learning. And he ultimately decided that he then wanted to try to build a low-cost housing community for the very poor. Not out of Karachi this time, but out of Lahore, which is in the Punjab um, in Pakistan. And when we first went, it looked like the moon, Kandahar. I mean, this was just a big piece of land in the middle of nowhere, and I thought this was going to be a really long process, and certainly it was a really long process. Uh, the hardest thing for him was registering the land. Before you can do anything, you have to register the land to show that you have legal title. Housing is another really corrupt industry. All the basic services are because government plays such a strong role in it. And so we said to Javad, we don't believe in bribes, you don't believe in bribes, this is patient capital. Wait out the registrars. Don't pay a, a bribe. It took 18 months for them to register this land. But finally he did. And we thought we were on our way. And ultimately, he built one house. Um, and you can imagine, when we first saw this house, we thought it was the most beautiful thing we'd ever seen. Um, and I thought everybody would be lining up to buy the house because um, they lived in these slums, terrible places, ruled by mafia, no electricity, very dangerous. But in fact, not a single person wanted to buy the house, um, or any of the houses. This was the model house. And the reason was they'd been ripped off so many times that everybody was paranoid to put their money down for something that might not ever materialize. Then a really crazy thing happened. Um, I actually write about it in the book, but we came to see the house. It was a beautiful day. It was the middle of the monsoons. You can see all the water in the rice paddy around the house. And there was this path that led from the housing development into a village. And there was another village on the other side of the house. And I noticed as the sun was going down that maybe we should 
not be out um, in this uh, peri-urban area after dark and so said it was time to go. And as we were walking back to the other village, we hear this boom. And before we know it, we were caught in a crossfire, 50 young men with Uzis uh, shooting past us, which is uh, really not a good place you ever want to be. And um, I held my colleague's hand, you know, just walking through this really miserable experience. Um, and thankfully, and kind of shockingly, nobody got hurt. And we went back the next morning, um, really not thinking about anything, but all the, vill the villagers paid attention. What the villagers saw was that we were not a fly-by-night operation. What the villagers saw was that we were as committed to them as we wanted them to be to us. And it was literally that day that people started signing up to buy these houses. And um, now, about 2,000 people live in this really beautiful community. And there's a mall now, at least people call it a mall, and a school, and um, all kinds of services, and the people couldn't be prouder. I sat with the community last time I was there, and um, they said that even though they had, to, they had to really sacrifice, they had to sell their wives jewelry, they had to put everything on the line to buy mortgages, to buy houses and get mortgages for these homes, they said, we feel safe, we know each other, we really feel a sense of hope. One thing I had not really thought about, though, was um, ethnic conflict and how it was going to play itself out in Saibon, which is the name of this development. Because in this past year, 3,000 people have been killed in ethnic violence across Pakistan. Um, and Saibon is unbelievably diverse. Not only Shia and Sunni, which are two kinds of Islam, um, but within the Sunni Islam, many different sects. Uh, and so I happened to be in Lahore, about a mile away from a mosque when it was attacked by terrorists and a hundred people were killed senselessly, brutally. You can imagine the fear and the sadness and the confusion that went through the whole society. Uh, and it just so happened on the very next morning I was going back to the housing development. And this time I remembered that there was only one mosque despite all this ethnic diversity and I asked Javad how does the community navigate who gets to pray on Friday in the mosque if there are so many different groups of people that want to use it and he said you know we fought for a really long time people lots of confusion within the community um, but ultimately we decided this is our community and that we weren't just building houses we were building a place of safety a place where people could know each other a people where people could learn to care about each other. So while it was not comfortable, we ultimately decided to elect three imams from different sects. And one, those imams would rotate who would lead Friday prayer, but everyone in the community across all sects would pray together. It's a small story. In a country of 180 million people, it's a story of 2,000. But when I get to tell that story inside Pakistan, I get to tell a story of success. Acumen Fund has gotten its money paid back. 2,000 people have a safe place to live. The first commercial mortgages ever made in the country to people who make less than $120 a month have been made. And because we're big mouths and we talk all the time about the fact that it took so long to register the land because of the Dweeby registrar who wouldn't let us get the, the land without um, paying a bribe, government worked with us to create a new policy whereby anyone who wants to to invest now and create low-income housing can bypass the registrar and go directly into the Ministry of Housing. So what I learned from that is sometimes building a beautiful jewel of a company that makes sense financially but also has real heart and soul and ultimately impacts people who are too often invisible, too often left out is really the story we need to tell each other. It's the story we need to tell our businesses. It's the story we need to tell our governments. Um, it's the story of a kind of hope that is hard earned. It's not soft. It's not squishy. Um, it's the kind of hope we need in the world. But if I think about moral leadership, um, I think it's probably the thing we most have to think about what it takes to cultivate inside ourselves. One of the Acumen Fund fellows is a young man named Joseph Abiyarahanga. He comes from Western Uganda. He comes from a low-income family. 
And he said, I always hated when people called us poor because poor is a condition of your economic status. It has nothing to do with who you are as a person. Um, but he said, because I was a farmer, I thought I would really be really good at working with other farmers. We had put him as a fellow into a farming community in Western Kenya where he was going to be selling hybrid seeds to low-income farmers, most of them women. And he tells the story of how he made mistake after mistake after mistake working with these women until he could finally learn that even though he was a farmer too, he came from a different culture and as a man he saw agriculture in a very different way. And he said, you know, to me, leadership is really like a panicle of rice. He said, because at the height of the harvest, it's green, it's verdant, it's proud, it reaches to the sky, it feeds the world. And he said, but right before the harvest, it bows down with a great sense of humility and gratitude, and it touches the earth. And when I think about the kind of leadership we need right now, what your generation can represent, it is this blend of audacity and humility. It's this blend of what Martin Luther King would call love and power. He once said that love without power is anemic and sentimental, and that power without love is reckless and abusive. And what we need is the courage to walk holding love and power, to look at the solutions to the problems that exist in the world, to recognize that they're all there, they're all there for us, and that we have the resources, we have the technology, we have the imagination to solve those problems. What we really need to find inside each of us is the will. And what we really need to find inside each of us is the knowledge that none of us can change history by ourselves. None of us can do any of this by ourselves. But if we each play a small part, if we each take our gift and give it in a way that recognizes that there may be someone to receive it, and if there's not, not to be undaunted, that we can make the change that we need to see in the world. And so, as I look at all of you, I think that there's no greater manifestation of what hope really does look like. And our generation looks at your generation realizing that you're a lot better than we were. Um, and we need you to be a lot better than we, are, than we were. And so I wish you, in whatever you choose to take on in this world, um, courage, audacity, humility, um, love, and a lot of hope. And I certainly wish you Godspeed. So thank you very much.